Thank you again for listening to the Fusion Podcast. Today's episode involves a very special guest. Dr. Binderbauer is the co-founder of TAE Technologies. He is an expert in reactor kinetics, equilibrium theory, and the stability of a beam-driven field reverse configuration. He's also managed to do something incredible, create a private company with the express purpose of generating electricity from fusion energy. special interview. I am interviewing Dr. Michael Binderbauer. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. The first question is, can you talk about Norman Rostoker and can you tell me how you first met him? That's something I'm obviously extremely fond of, uh, as probably people that listen to this would know Norman. I mean, he was a giant in the field, of course, and it was an incredible privilege and one of the highlights of my life to work with him. I actually stumbled on him as a very naive undergraduate. I had no particular interest in plasma physics. I was more interested in astrophysics and deep space cosmology and galaxy formation. The kind of things that youngsters dream about. Fusion wasn't on my A-list. And I took a course in plasma physics, actually, that he taught at the University of California here in Irvine. And it was one of the more challenging courses I took as an undergraduate. And I did fairly well in my entire career as a student. But I had gotten accustomed to in physics to have this sort of building and all these blocks had a logical fit. And plasma physics is sort of this weird hybrid of things. And it has some engineering in it. It has some very deep physics, statistical mechanics, you name it. It's a complicated multi-body problem. And as a student, this is kind of an obtuse building. And it didn't have the kind of nice ladder that you have with mechanics or E&M. And so it was difficult. And so I actually thought very little of it. I thought Norman was a charming fellow, told us interesting stories. And every time when we started asking deeper questions, he went another layer deeper. And this was basically clear he could go infinite and he would walk off from plasma physics into a solid state and transistors. He had such a wealth of experience his entire career and they reflected. But after that, my mind still stayed on astrophysics. I had applied a whole bunch of programs back east. My first choice then was Johns Hopkins. They just had landed the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute, and it was on their Maryland campus in Baltimore. And I got an early acceptance on that with a scholarship and everything. So my life was perfectly in order. I accepted it. I didn't even wait for other reply letters. And then came a sobering moment. My dad had some business out of the FDA and said, why don't you come along and you can visit Hopkins. And I honestly never actually visited before. I just did this off. A lot of the interesting observational data will come in and, you know, it's just the right place to go. And so I ended up touring this. It was late winter into early spring. There was still snow on the ground. I remember as if it was yesterday and I was driving up from DC and getting off at near the inner harbor and driving up Charles Street. So all these boarded up houses and with my European background, that by itself was shocking already. They had these semi above ground sewer pipes near the campus and there were homeless and others laying there against, I guess, what was warmer than the rest of the ground. And I looked at this and said, can I really work here for five years? Probably the hardest intellectual challenging years of my life and decided with a tough process. Then eventually after a little while that this wasn't going to work. My dad looked at it too, said, I understand you son. And so I came back out. I had to write a letter to Hopkins saying, I'm sorry. And I have family reasons. I had to start the graduate process there. And then I was stuck with nothing. Because at that point, all the admissions decisions were made for graduate school. So I sat with nothing sort of semi lost my last month as an undergraduate on campus and they run into Norman in the hallway and he remembered me. I mean, I did well in his course and he said, you know what's going on and I'm telling him a little bit and we get in a conversation and he pulls me in his office and he says, look, it's so bad. You can spend a year here interim with me. If you like it, you stay on. If not, I know pretty much everybody in the world can make phone calls for you in physics. And if you want somewhere else, I can help you. So there's really nothing you're going to lose. 
And when he started talking about this idea of a reactor and he hadn't really worked anything out, it started to really tickle. And it was primarily because I had a very strong interest in why things. So I started rethinking this a little bit and said, well, you know what, if I go into astrophysics, I'm going to be in this ivory tower. If I go with Norman here, I can work on this reactor project that could have a huge impact. It's practical, it's close term, and it has a lot of interesting physics in it. The concept still needed a lot of embellishments and so forth. So I made that commitment for a year, and I can tell you a month into this, I never looked back. And he's been the kindest and best mentor anybody could have had, a real friend. He wasn't just my scientific father, he's really a second father figure in more ways than one. I and mean, I was just as fond of him as it was my biological dad, who was equally formative. So both of these sort of father figures were beautiful to have. And, you know, I was super privileged. And on his 80th birthday, he asked me to give a dinner note. And I titled it saying, thank God Johns Hopkins is in the middle of Baltimore. People were wondering, what is Michael going to talk about? He had this incredible intuitive skill of without even doing the calculation where it should lead you have the sixth sense for things, which is very humbling, even more so for a person like me at that age that was struggling with understanding the basic concepts. But I never lost the amazement for that. It's just that uncanny sense of finding the essential and going after that, extracting the information and the, the breakthroughs. But it was also his humanity. You could come to his house, his wife would cook for some of us just take care of us in many ways more than just as a mentor in an intellectual sense. The giant of a human being, kind, affectionate, uh, warm-hearted. There's not one negative attribute I would apply to him. And I mean, those years were magical. And I fondly look back at those as some of the greatest times of my life. Having had now the privilege of having met a lot of his students, there's about 40 of us that got their PhDs under him. This echoes strongly to everybody. And the ones that came before me and the ones that came after, everybody would more or less tell you the same story. He was intellectually a giant and as a human being. Can you take us back to when you decided to form the company? So what time frame was that and how was that first decided? So that's a great question. Post me deciding to work on this with him, we began developing a lot of the underpinning physics. This is a part of plasma physics that is highly connected with kinetic theory. So there's a lot of theoretical underpinnings that standard literature weren't quite applicable to what we wanted to do. So we had to do some of that, which was great for me as a young person to get broad exposure to very fundamental things, as well as then the applied stuff on top of it. A lot of it was initial pencil and paper. So we began developing this concept and the underpinning theory. And then, of course, you need money to do these things. I mean, you need to buy a computer, you need various things. And this wasn't even the days of doing experiments yet. And the DOE was at that point very much deciding to downsize towards the tokamak. Most of the programs that were out there were shrinking. I remember Los Alamos had a nice program in field reverse configurations. It was sort of coming on the chopping block. It wasn't the only one. Most things were being reorganized. And so it was the wrong time to come knock at the federal coffers and ask for money. The peer review process and everything was such that, you know, I, I don't blame anybody. I mean, it was a shrinking feeding trough and now have a newcomer come doesn't sound very appealing. So the guys who had a, a say technically whether to give you a thumbs up or down were more compelled to try to defend their turf, well, not even a negative way, it's just survival. So in that climate in the 90s, it was very difficult to start something new with federal money. And Norman was not one to give up easily, though I would say, and I think this is also one of the characteristics I always enjoyed seeing and, and learning from him, the sort of never surrender, never give up, don't take no for an answer. You get knocked down, you get up the next morning and you knock at the next door because there's a new opportunity. He was always one of those ultra positive, optimistic people that could just ignore the criticism, ignore the negative. He knew what was right or what he perceived to be the, the, the creative spark there and the, the value in that. And so he pursued that. So as we were trying to raise federal awareness in the confusion community and it failed us, we got to discussion about is there a future for this or is there not? And if there is, what is it? What may it be? And one of the advantages that I had there is I had a father who had was a serial entrepreneur. He had built uh, three companies, both in Europe and here successfully, although not all with all smooth sailing, you go through the ups and downs. So I had grown up around that. And so to me, that was a natural potential alternative. And so we started talking about that. And Norman had also prior exposure to some privately financed efforts in future. So he didn't think this was crazy. 
In fact, then he took it on with zeal, much more so even than I did, because he threw his name and weight behind it. And we tried to get private interest. And it was about 97, 98. There was a, another effort that had some overlap technically by a fellow named Bogdan Maglic. He's well known. Yeah, he's well known. And so he moved out to Irvine actually to collaborate with Norm. And so during the years, there was another fusion effort that had garnered some private interests of a few people. And it fell apart ultimately. And these people had gotten to know us. And they sort of like our idea and the way Norman's personality better than what Bogdan Maglic offered. Offered. And so we ended up attracting some of these. And most probably important was Glenn Seaborg. Glenn Seaborg was a giant and doesn't need any introduction within the UC and the science community in the world and in the US. He was sort of what I call a friend of the house. He visited Irvine occasionally, or if we were up to Berkeley, we visited with him. I got to know him too. And Glenn was also a member of the Bohemian Club. It's kind of like a men's club of people of stature and influence in San Francisco that has these famous outings in the summer along the Russian River and around Santa Rosa. Within this summer affair, they have these camps where literally captains of industry or leaders of science or thought leaders camp out together in these subgroups. And Glenn was in one of these groups and he attracted interest out of those guys, Spectral executives and a few other folks. And between those guys, Glenn Seaborg, and then some of the people around the Maglitch, in most particular, Harry Hamlin, for instance, the actor environmentalist, was very influential in the formative stages of Tralfa. As these people came together, Glenn helped facilitate from the University of California an early option towards a license for the work that Norman and I had done. And it came together beautifully. It was about April, I think, of 98 or thereabout that we formed Trialpha with the intent to create a vehicle to fund experimental work. And it wasn't baked out at that time that we would do this all exclusively privately. We were thinking perhaps we could use it as a conduit to bring money in that we then contract to the university to carry out the work. And that's actually how we started in 2000 when we began our real first experimental work. It was at a lab at the University of California, Irvine, that Norman had run for quite a while. I mean, he was more a theorist, but he always had a fairly strong applied side, a lab of about 10 ish people that had expertise in accelerator technologies and a few other plasma ancillary things. And so we began the nucleus of the technical team out of that. And we had this conglomerate of people loosely put together, friends and family now that formed the early board and the early passed the hat around and put a few dollars in kind of resources, tens of thousands of dollars at that point. And we did some IP work that the university was willing to start on, but we had to reimburse. So that was one of the first things Tralfa did. And in 2000, we began with this lab effort. And at that point, we were able to get out of that group and their Rolodex about a million dollars aggregated of what I would still call more or less friends and family money. Part of that had to go to the university for upkeep and things. And what really went into the early experiment was probably in the order of half a million or so. And we built a machine that today we still call the sewer pipe. It was a fiberglass tube typically used in sewer systems. And it had poor vacuum capability, but it was inexpensive and we could drill it with men and by hand. And we built a vacuum vessel and we tried working on an early form of an FRC. And then end of 2000 to 2001, we began injecting a little bit of more directional plasma from Marshall plasma gun tangentially into the site of this. So all the early explorations around the basic concept process was done with that until about 2002 or so, at which point we began getting traction with people that were connected to these early incoming folks and that allowed us to expand our reach to the next layer of benefactors. And we raised a couple of more million dollars in our A round, which then allowed us to migrate out of the university into our own lab space out here in the Foothill Ranch or Lake Forest, which is about 20 minutes from campus. It's a little less expensive out here from a lease perspective. We migrated out here. We brought most of these early Rostocker lab folks with us. And at that point, I had really taken on the full-time cook and bottle washer role to kind of, you know, make this happen. I should have added that before that, in the mid to later 90s, before we had Tralfa critically off the ground, to keep a light on, I was doing tech consulting works. I was doing some toner work for Rico. I did some work for derivative of Siemens x-rays. I had a, a small contract with NASA. I mean, I did a whole bunch of stuff to keep the lights on, basically. And 
So that was kind of the early days. They're not necessarily pretty. They're full of a lot of grunt work and elbow grease and to get this off and get the momentum and get the kind of critical mass of believers and people involved that you need to bootstrap your way through those early moments. In hindsight, it's fair to say that luck is as much part of that than the timing as there is skill. Things sometimes, they could go one way or the other. We got lucky in many times around where we just fell at the right moment, the right place with the right people coming in and we were allowed to live another day. And then of course, from there, it becomes much more smoother sailing and much we build a real infrastructure around it, not just technically, but on the business development side. There's going to be people that are going to be listening to this that are probably involved in some sort of startup. They've got some concept they want to push. Sure. How would you describe the machine that you've built to normal people, people who don't know physics at all? The way I like to always talk about the problem, think about plasma as this ball of oozy jello, very liquidy jello, and you're trying to suspend that in the middle of space with a bunch of rubber bands. So magnetic fields are very much like rubber bands. They have field line tension. You can sort of pluck it and it restores. And inside of this cradle or cocoon of these rubber bands, you're trying to hold this very liquidy jello. Not a pretty picture. What will happen? It'll drip right out. It'll ooze away. And that's what plasmas tend to do. Particles are lost. Energy is lost. In most of the programs, they've attacked this by saying, well, maybe I can upgrade the rubber bands. I put more rubber bands around. I create almost a rubber sheet to enclose this so it starts to look more like something that can contain liquidy stuff. What we did, and really this is all credit to Norm, he said, why don't we look for making the plasma more intelligent? Can we stiffen this up? Can we turn this jello more into a solid object? And then you really truly need a few rubber bands. And that was our mission. And it came from an observation in accelerator physics. We said, why are accelerators working so well? And how can you hold clouds of charged particles there and see a machine like CERN? And they can do this at operator will. And why do we struggle on time scales the millionth of a second? The idea of rubber bands and using less of those and having more of a stiff jello in there was very much what we wanted to do when we succeeded with that. And well, the FRC is this rubber band bundle. And what's interesting about it is, is that it's a self-confining kind of topology. So as I described earlier, the way the world at large tax fusion is, you throw more rubber bands on. What that translates to in real life is complex magnetic topologies, lots of coils. They're expensive. They have to be large scale because most of the confinement is poor scales favorably with size. So you build them larger. And so that adds cost. The FRC is really a refreshing difference. It says, I don't impose a lot of magnetic field from the outside. I let the plasma create its own field. If a current runs down a wire, it deflects a magnet. This is a, one of the early Ersted experiments. And so if you have a plasma, which is really perfect conductor, and you have a current in it, and it will create its own self-magnetic field. And if you design the flows in the plasma right, you can create a confining magnetic field you can create such a structure around a bundle of current in the plasma. Field reverse configuration, taking that to the extreme, where this self-created magnetic field becomes your cradle too. So it forms that cocoon that things are in. Is it something that's relatively inexpensive because you don't need a lot of magnetic fields externally? It's sort of a minimum energy state. So the FRC is a nice self-organized setup. I've often described your concept, a stick and a hoop where the FRC is the loop of plasma making a self-contained field, and you use particle beams like a stick to keep the hoop spinning, to keep whacking it. Is that a fair analogy? Yes, it's perfect segue to the next evolutionary step to describe our concept. So assuming you have an FRC, you have a topology with this flowing plasma current in there that generates the enveloping field, the self-field. How do you maintain that? And how can you keep it stable? Here is, you said a hoop and stick. Another way to look at that is spinning tops. If you have a top spinning in the gravitational field, it does well as long as it's spinning at the right rate. And as it slows down, it begins to wobble and eventually it flips. But we all know that we can stabilize it by keeping it spinning. So we apply a tangential torque. Now this is a plasma ball. So rotation is good to some degree. You over rotate it, it falls apart. You under rotate it, it falls apart. So a spinning top is a very good analogy you can do most of the stability analysis using this mechanical analog. 
we take this FRC that's sitting there and spinning, and we are adding more energy in through these beams, and that comes in the form of tangential injections. The energy with these particles starts to create additional rotation and angular momentum, and it keeps the object spinning. And if we do that at the right rate, we don't overspin it, and it sits there very stably. We have developed over the years some really cute technology to break it if it over rotates. So the beams essentially are adding more and more energy and you don't want to go too high. There's a frictional shearing on the surface of this FRC that you can use to slow it down and keep it right. So spinning tops, stick and hoop, those are all good ways to look at it. And stability really behaves very similar to those mechanical analog. About how big is Norman, the machine that's built? So Norman is about 100 feet long, sort of like two large buses back to back. It's about 45 feet wide and probably about 28 feet tall, something like that. So that's all the vacuum systems, magnets around it, the beam systems that inject with eight beam injectors on it, firing towards the center. And then, of course, there is a large scale peripheral componentry that supplies power, etc. And Norman is a hungry beast. It consumes about 750 megawatts peak power. That's about the output of a large power plant. So we have to store that intermittently from the grid slowly and before a shot in capacitive and flywheel storage, and then we unleash it. But the central machine, you think of something like two double-decker buses back to back. Am I right in saying that you guys currently have a world record for the longest stable large FRC? I don't want to step on anybody. For a hot FRC, something on the kiloelectron volt or 10, 15 million degree energetics, clearly we definitely hold the record in completely stable. People have made these smaller, very cold FRCs that are fractions of an EV temperature where you can use rotating magnetic fields to maintain. But I would say those are not really fusion relevant plasma regimes. If you're in hot fusion relevant plasma regime, then clearly we would have world record on that. It's not something that's technologically limited. What we did in 2015 when we achieved this on Norman's precursor C2U, we could have run from a physics perspective endless. What limited us was the stored energy in the building. Prior machine didn't consume 750 megawatts, it was about 20 to 25 megawatts, but that also doesn't come for free. You have to feed it from the grid and our grid feed is a couple of megawatts at peak. The limit really isn't the science limit, it is mostly a limit of cost factor. It's a time factor. How long does it take you to build a facility like that? How much does it cost? And how long do you need to run? And I think that's the most critical thing for listeners to understand that while these timescales seem incredibly short, 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, the truth is that in plasma physics, those are half eternities. Timescales that determine success and failure may be 10 to 100 microseconds. So if you run milliseconds, you've outlived these phenomena by factors 100 and more. I have to look at these intrinsic timescales and say, if I can outlive the indigenous loss times by factors of 100, I have a more or less reached a sustained state. While that hasn't lasted for minutes or hours, it's a question of stored energy then to expand that time because the intrinsic lifetime and stability is there. It really represents the ability to do something at a long at will time scale if the rest of the engineering is made to match up with that. What's the company's next experimental goal in a month, six months and a year? Good questions. I always like to explain this to people that are outside the field by saying, think of fusion as going through sort of two major gauntlets. One is long enough, the other one is hot enough. Both of those are really dictated by the nuclear physics of the fuel cycle. So in our case, PB11 has a particular time scale over which all particles burn up. So you subject this fuel to the right high energetic state, it doesn't instantaneously fuse up. The probability for fusion is tiny. It takes a long time. It's a probabilistic game of getting enough of those fusion conducive collisions to occur, even though they're like a needle in a haystack, one in a million. But they do happen. And the longer the time that you can hold the stuff at those right conditions, the more of those collisions will happen, the more of the material you would burn up. If you do this long enough, then you can get net energy out. 
So long enough is a big deal. And then you have hot enough, which is equally given by the physics of the reaction. Just holding a soup together doesn't do it. So it has to be hot enough. The field, of course, hasn't succeeded with net energy output. And what people are struggling with is to get the right state held together long enough. And then you can replicate this at higher temperatures. And so what Trialpha did in 15 was long enough. We've shown in principle we can create these football-shaped FRC cocooned objects. We can spin them up, we can sustain them there and hold them there, literally at will, albeit at temperatures close to the interior of the sun. In order to cook a fuel or to burn deuterium tritium, you need higher temperatures. You need about 100 million degrees instead of 10 million degrees. So about a factor of 10 upgrade to get to deuterium tritium fusion. But the point scientifically is long enough first, and you can then replicate this at ever higher temperatures, it's an inch forward towards that hot enough, then you have the full scientific proof. And the intent with Norman is to essentially take what we did in C2U at, say, interior of the sun, and do this at about 10 times higher energetics. And if we can do that there and we get the same quality confinement and the same retention of energy and particles, then from there extrapolate towards a reactor state. From a goal perspective, Norman is a critical machine to give us loosely the scientific proof of principle. Currently, we brought Norman alive in the summer last year. We are now in the stage of replicating, pushing through the energy and performance level of C2U. So we've already reached that. The machine now performs as well as C2U. And that's a very big step for us because not only does it say it's reproducible, but it's a completely upgraded, bigger machine. It does it actually better at higher performance levels than what we had. And now we're beginning to heat it. So from here on out through the rest of the year, we're going to drive more energy in through the beam systems and through a few other feeder systems. We're going to create higher energy state, incrementally higher. And we're going to take a lot of data at each of these steps to understand how well the retention of energy and particles occurs at those elevated levels. Is it comparable and similar as it was in the prior machine? And that gives us the confidence. So my hope is 12 months from now to be at the point where we have a plasma that's multi-KEV, ion temperature, about a factor of 10 higher electron temperature than the old machine and get the same quality results. Longevity will be measured here for about 30 milliseconds, sustained flat level. So the stored energy sits there flat, the temperature sits there flat, the density sits there flat, and we can control that. In C2U, we would turn some of the feed systems off and then the plasma begins to decay. So you show a high degree of cause and effect in controlling this plasma at your will. We've done that up to about 10 milliseconds. We hope to do this here up to 30 at about 10 times total stored energy. And when those things succeed on Norman, then we're ready to take all that output and all this learning and scale it up to a machine that we now call Copernicus. First, we'll have multiple phases. It will eventually lead us to an net energy producing state. And that will transition through a deuterium tritium temperatures, although we wouldn't use DT, we use hydrogen, and then creep us all the way up. So the next step beyond Norman is really a march towards something that gets you into the burning plasma regime. In the beginning years, you guys were highly secretive. You didn't have a website for 15 years. What was the logic behind being secretive versus being public and open? Good question. This was conscious. This was very conscious. It was two simple reasons. One was that we didn't want to attract any kind of negative input from the community or stir the community up in any way before we felt we had really something new and substantive that really puts a marker down. We're a very conservative company at heart. And what I particularly didn't like, and I've been preaching this strongly to all the investors, and as you know, raising money sometimes requires you to hype things up. We've been very careful to be very measured on that. Fusion is such a high-flying subject matter where people have historically gotten multiple times very excited only for the souffle to deflate. And so what we didn't want to become is propagators of undue hype. We were very careful because you can't control that message. It just does its own thing. And so we didn't want to talk about us before we felt we had some substantive new things that really moved the needle. And so until 2015, we were very quiet. 
But although I will say from about 2010 on, we heavily began to publish to make sure that the science community understands but try to keep the more public side of media at bay from not overhyping what we do. So we ran a fine line between publishing fairly openly some of our technological advances. And we didn't necessarily do this just with performance data, but also the sophisticated diagnostics we built, the algorithms and computer codes we developed. So what we did is we put out papers on technical, very scientific elements to showcase that we were really a serious outfit. We have smart people here. We're using cutting edge modern techniques in diagnostics and computation and so on. And to showcase our capabilities in the scientific community and not become anything on the public persona that creates undue hype. I spend now considerably more time, for instance, talking to you. I actually enjoy that, but it does take time away that I could otherwise spend productively in-house. And it's not just me, it's the whole spectrum of folks. And so we were very conscious though, of the amount of time we would have to spend to do it right. Then you want to say the right things so they can say the right things and then propagate the truth. And that takes time away from other things. We also today have a PR team we didn't have. That costs money. In the early days, we were more interested in spending our dollars and every penny of it on the experiment and not on these other extravagant things. Now, why did we switch? We reached a level of technical maturity that I felt it was fair to tell the scientific community in more detail. Inadvertently, it happens. Science Magazine picked that up, for instance, the milestone on C2U, the 2015. But we weren't really seeking that. I do think that there's a promise now in what we do. And as long as we explain that well enough that nobody runs amok with this and says tomorrow they're going to build a fusion reactor, people understand that this is non-trivial and takes time and is a serious business. I think we've done okay with that. So now we have enough maturity. We have with enough fresh new scientific insights. One of these papers that we published in 15 in the physics of plasmas became a highly read paper of the year because people are really interested in it. And I think we had enough fresh new things that it was fair to publish that for people to see and helps us also. It's now on the real frontier, whereas before we were still technologically developing the foundation. And so those, I think, are the reasons why we transitioned. And the public side just comes as a byproduct of that. We weren't looking for that. or something. And I think it's okay now. I think we have reached a measured way of telling the story. And I haven't read anything yet where I've said, oh God, this is so grossly misleading. I feel horrible that happened. I'm actually very proud of not just us, but the journalistic world outside. The media have done a very good job. A lot of people before they published something, they let me read it sometimes. And they said, did we understand this right? Can you proofread these critical things? And I thought that was a tremendous level of professionalism and respect for the subject matter. You try to get it right. And so collectively, I feel really good about that. And I don't know, perhaps we could have done that there for earlier, but that's kind of the backdrop for that. You guys have another milestone that you recently passed. You put a commercial product out on the market that uses fusion. Can you describe boron neutron capture therapy and product that you're selling? Before I go into that, what's the backdrop on this? We've developed a ton of technology here, and it was developed through this weird forcing function of developing the support technologies for our fusion efforts. That led us to develop certain things with a very fresh perspective than anybody else that develops technologies like these power supplies, magnet systems, accelerators, beam injectors, and so on. Boron neutron capture therapy was something that was thrown into my consciousness through a friend on the outside. And we're not medical people at all, but this came through sometimes osmosis. It's a technique that's been around conceptually probably back to the 60s. And it's rather simple and very elegant. The idea is that if you have a tumor and you can somehow get boron 10 into the tumor tissue, preferentially, ideally have nothing in the healthy cell, but you have all the boron 10 enriched in the tumor. If you can do that, then you can shower that entire tissue structure with neutrons. The boron 10 is one of the best neutron absorbers in the periodic table and give a mini fission event. Boron 10, it falls apart into an alpha particle and in the lithium. And these two things get spilled out as the nucleus breaks apart. And the kinetic energy in that is destructive over about the size of a human cell. So if you can find a way to get boron into a cell 
and then shower what we call epithermal neutrons. So these are neutrons that are 10, 20 keV in energy. They're relatively low energy neutrons. The neutrons won't harm tissue. The boron 10 is totally inert. It won't do anything. When the two things come together within the tumor cells, then you can destroy those locally. I like to call this cellular surgery. If you think of chemotherapy and broadband radiation, those are like carpet bombing. This is like sniper attack. It's been out as an idea dating back into the 60s or early 70s. Problem with it is neutron sources weren't readily available other than the nuclear reactors. And they have about 2,000 patients prior to now treated with this, sort of anecdotal on the level of typical clinical trials, but it's not zero and it showed incredible promise. People with head and neck cancers and brain cancers were injected intravenously with boron-carrying vector drugs and it seeks out tumor. And then they would inject this and they would take patients literally to a duct coming out of a nuclear reactor and expose the brain. They had remarkable success, some seemingly incurable things going to remission. If you only need one treatment, it takes about 30 minutes and you're done. Compared to say x-rays, where if you have a brain tumor and you want to irradiate that, you're coming in in the order of seven to 10 weeks, five days a week for a few hours. You have a lot of collective damage to neurological tissue that isn't tumorous. This technique has this great promise, but it's lacking a good neutron source. When I came across this, I said, you know what? I think our accelerators are uniquely fit for this. We like to operate at relatively low energies compared to a cyclotron. We're operating at hundreds of kilovolts to perhaps MeV, but we do this at massive current, amps, tens of amps. In fact, the amperage is so high that if you were to deploy one of our fusion systems on a patient, you literally bore a hole in the person. So we had to de detune this by about a factor of a, a thousand to make the ideal source. It's relatively compact. It's not very expensive. It's a system like that is 10-ish million and under. It can fit into the radiation vault of a hospital. Well, if we can do that, we can really democratize this treatment. We can make it available to the world. We can design machines that are on the scale of an MRI. They can fit into a modern hospital and then you can deploy them and then people can get treated locally and don't have to travel somewhere to the five, six sites worldwide where they have had these nuclear reactors. Is it fair to say that this machine uses fusion to generate the neutron? Basically, what we do is we accelerate protons. Okay? So the protons hit a lithium target. So yeah, there is an interaction where there's sort of a fusion event between the proton and the lithium, and that generates the neutrons. We're starting to hair split here, whether it's fair to call it fusion. It certainly uses mini fission within the patient. We're breaking a boron 10 nucleus apart through the absorption of a neutron. In the intermediary, the proton beam gets converted to a neutron beam through a fusion process with lithium-7 involved in the target. But it's different from the fusion that we're pursuing. It's more an accelerator physics process. The important thing that this is a product on the commercial marketplace that uses fusion is an important statement in and of itself. Yeah, I agree. I have two more questions. What should the U.S. be doing differently to support fusion broadly? I'm European by birth, but I feel more like an American now. I spend most of my productive adult years in this incredible country. So as a European slash American, as a Western person, I have to say this with some form of sadness. The Chinese is the wave of the future. They're incredibly dynamic. They have a vision and a drive and a sense of urgency that's lacking over here. Trial for perhaps excluded from that for a moment. But if you look at the fusion landscape, whether in the US or in Europe, we're building ITER. It's a good step. It's a massive project, though. It requires pooling of resources and people that don't necessarily want to work together. I'm not sure it will lead to something economic one day. I haven't studied it enough, so it's not mine to say that. And as a citizen of the world, first and foremost, I want a fusion to succeed because I believe that the only source of energy that will sustain civilization in the long run has to have fusion. There's certainly a space for various renewables, but fusion is going to have to be there as a 24-7 source, hopefully one day a 90% of better capacity factor. So it's a big deal. The U.S., it starts with our community. We're too fragmented in knowing what we want, perhaps. The government, therefore, is at a limbo on what they should fund. So we're partners in ITER. We have lost a lot of the attractive domestic machines. We haven't done a good job, therefore, in retaining the talent here. A lot of the young people these days, even if they're getting educated at the MITs of the world, they end up going to Europe or Asia to do the experiments because that's where the more cutting edge equipment is. 
That's a brain train. And a lot of these people, they go there for graduate school, perhaps, or for their graduate experiments. They defend their thesis here. But in the meantime, they've formed their scientific family overseas. They may have even created a biological family. And for them to come back, what is there to come back to here? There's none of this glorious days of big science that we used to have during the Cold War. And where the U.S. really fell in its own and it just developed what became the dominant force in science and in economics and whatnot. Today, we're lacking these projects and that's a big danger. It starts with the students and the next generation of scientific leaders attritioning away. The lack of these visionary projects having others spill out into society. Then we do a particularly poor job educating the public on that. Fusion is a massively complicated undertaking. It has humongous different technological pillars that have to feed into it. I always like to compare that to the moon landing and NASA's mission. When Kennedy said by the end of the decade, we shall have a man on the moon, that mobilized an incredible generation of tinkerers, scientists, engineers. And with it came a massive spill out of, of products and capability that then permeated society in positive ways. I always love to talk about Velcro tape because to me that's such a mundane thing, yet it's something that came out of this NASA effort. And you can look on your desk, I bet you you'll find somewhere a piece of Velcro. Microwaves, modern communications, computers, there's just an enormous wealth of stuff that got incubated because of something like the moon race. So fusion is similar, whether it's lasers and microwaves or pulse power or power electronics, you name it. And these things will define the next layers of societal benefits and quality of life. And then they become an economic engine of, so if a country gives up these kinds of projects, then these derivative fallout disappears as well. So it's fusion by itself, but it's also all these spin-off things. And when I look to China today, I see they have a sense of urgency. We look at the environment today and we all know that we're causing a destructive impact. And with the sort of lack of urgency that I see, I don't think this country is going to be in the frontier of any of these things. And China, driven, of course, by perhaps worse pollution than anybody, has a different urgency and fire in the belly. And if I look at Trialpha's needs, I'm starting to look around and say, well, we can't do all this lift by ourselves where we need to go to a reactor. There are critical gaps in expertise. If I look at, say, med esoteric material science and so on, we need a shot in the arm. And where do I get that? It's not that the West doesn't have the expertise, but it doesn't have the fire in the belly. So when I look for people to work with me, I need to find people who are resonant with, I want this done yesterday rather than tomorrow. And Trialpha is very much an impatient entity. We want to move. So I need to look for people who can move with me. And I look at China and I find great resonance there. As a Western person, that should be disturbing. And yes, it is. But at least there's somebody on this ball in the universe who shares the urgency and the drive to do it. And I think that's a singularly important function if you develop technology. Don't be too timid. Reach for the stars. And I see these qualities now strongly reflected in China, and I don't quite see them here. We haven't played this out yet to the finality. Of, I hope there's still a course correction coming. Trialpha can help be an incubator domestically. I would love for us to do that. Well, that seems like a great place to end the interview. Is there anything else that you want to add? So Norman, he looked for an applied aim product. I think fusion is not a scientific undertaking. We're not here to create textbook knowledge. We really want to move the needle and we want to derive an end product that works. It has to not just scientifically succeed and be compatible with technological availability, but also be economic, it should be benign to the environment and so on. And I, what I like about Trialpha and what hopefully your readers can take away is that the company was built on that mission. We'll never forget the end goal. Be focused to that. Reverse engineer almost what we should do today based on what we need one day down the road. And if that's hard or the science is difficult, don't shy away from that because the aim justifies you to do that. And I think that's very different than how it's pursued where it's a more scientific meandering process. People move where it's perhaps the next easiest step. And that may not be the direct step that leads you to where you really need to be in the long run. And I think Trialpha is, I'm very proud of it, has been very disciplined and very focused. Do not lose sight of that. And I'm looking here across my office and there is a, a little model of a reactor that I had made for Norman for his 75th birthday. And we gave this to him in 2000 when we started the company. When he passed away in Christmas 2014 and I inherited this back and it sits here on my desk.
And that looks almost exactly what we're still building today. That continuity is derivative of looking at the end first and defining what you do from that. In every technology development, you need this anchoring guide, this rope on which you carry yourself up. I believe we have that. As your readers think about fusion and all the complexities, I think in the end, it's supposed to deliver something that makes us produce electrons, hopefully cheaply and plentiful without pollution. Trauffa has had that as its guiding light and it stays on that track. Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it and I hope you have a good